love for you to share a little wisdom with the room. Um, we're going to start with three-time gold medalist in beach volleyball and 2008 Women of the Year, Carrie Walsh Jennings. Yay. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very proud to be here. I love glamour. I love everything that you guys do and touch. Um, my words of wisdom are um, we attract in our life what we focus on. I'm a big believer in that. I live it every single day. So we might as well focus on what we want. Focus on the good. Great snaps. And next we have Missy Franklin, five-time gold medalist in swimming and a 2012 Glamour Woman of the Year. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much for having all of us here. My words of wisdom are that we all have chances in our own lives to go for the gold, whether it's athletically, whether it's being a great mom, a great sister, or just a great human being. Um, so stay true to who you are and what you believe in and never let anyone change that. And now, Olympic gold medalist in soccer, FIFA Women's World Cup champion, and one of last year's Glamour Women of the Year, Alex Morgan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, my words of wisdom are just through the last year or two, fighting for equal pay. I have really realized that power is in sharing knowledge, and I just look at all the influence we have in this room today, and we can all be so uplifting and um, share all of our knowledge without sacrificing our own aspirations. So that's the only thing I have to say about that. <laughs> now meet one of my personal idols, a member of the U.S. fencing team, Ibtiaj Muhammad. Hi, thanks for having me today. So happy to be here in L.A. Um, in today's climate, it's so important to be a representation of inclusiveness. I'm so proud to represent Team USA and hope to continue the conversation on acceptance, inclusion, diversity, and everything in between. So thank you. And WNBA MVP who plays for the LA Sparks, a two-time Olympic gold medalist in basketball, Candace Parker. My words of wisdom are, it's not what happens in your life, it's how you react to it. And I think everybody goes through adversity, obstacles, and has challenges in their lives. And um, I get that knowledge from the late, my late coach, Pat Summit, who just handled everything with a lot of class and a lot of grace and a lot of dignity. And now with seven Olympic medals, five of which are gold, in swimming, Dana Ballmer. Thank you so much. As they've all said, we're so excited to be here. And my words of wisdom are to set incredibly high goals, but that those can also seem daunting at times. And so to focus on the small daily goals and just getting better at something every day. And then you'll love the journey wherever those daily goals add up in your life. And U.S. Paralympic track sprinter, Scout Bassett. I'm by far the shortest of the group. <laughs> um, I just want to say it's so important to run your own race in your life. It, you don't have to do things every, the way everybody else does it. And, um, you know, no matter where you come from or what you look like, there's just nothing that you can't overcome. Living life on the merry-go-round And you can't find a I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out. Who is the time for all of us to stand up and say enough is we enough? I'll rise up, rise like the day, I'll rise up in spite of the age. Raise your hand if you feel this has been a little bit of a traumatic week. Raise your hand if you feel like you could use a little inspiration in your life right now. All right. Personally, I am ready for a mega supersized dose of woman power, so there is nowhere I would rather be than right here in this room. So what I learned, I took away three great lessons. First lesson, never speak in a loud voice and drop names in a restaurant. <laughs> Second great lesson, was that listening was one of the most powerful tools I could ever have. And the third was I wasn't going to be driven by other people's perceptions of myself. That was a waste of time. What I was going to be driven by was the work. Uh, it's pretty remarkable what can happen once you become the boss. You become, um, 
you become sort of a, a version of yourself that you don't know. <laughs> um, I like to think of myself one way. Clearly, that's not the way the rest of people think of me. But I work on it, and I think that one of the things that's important is to remember that you are now bigger than yourself. You are now every decision that you make as you become the boss, every decision you make, no matter how, whether you decide to, how you treat your assistant, everything you're doing is a sense of being a role model, and people are watching you. And so when I arrived at Yahoo, it was after a really turbulent period. I was the seventh CEO in 61 months. Mm. Uh, and my view was, if fixing Yahoo were easy, someone would have done it already. So I spent time listening. I literally spent the first month, spent about two hours every day, even though I'm a shy person in the cafeteria, talking to anyone who would talk to me, to basically get people's ideas, understand what worked, what didn't work. For, as leaders, a lot of times you don't get to do things. You don't get to actually design clothes or write code anymore. But what you do get to do is work for the team in terms of removing barriers, making it easier for them to get things done. I had a moment while driving um, when I was just feeling low and down, and I was like, oh my god, I'm me. And that <laughs> was just such a revelatory moment in that no one had the same, no one shared the same POV uh, as me. No one could say the things that I said. No one sees the world like I did. And I think that that's what creatives really should embrace at the end of the day. And so once I had that moment, it was just like, I needed to embrace that. And um, it became a bit, it became easier to stay true to my vision. And, to listen, but still funnel it through my lens. It's a, you said something that's, that's banging around in my head now. I'm me. You know, there's only one me. And I, I don't think you know, that's been a part of the conversation of women enough, where we actually take ourselves out, we stop for a minute, and say, I'm me, and I can do this. I'm just still amazed at this point that at 44 years old, I now have a, a great career on the internet. I've interviewed President Barack Obama. I've interviewed Hillary Clinton. I've interviewed a lot of great people because of the internet and what I was able to accomplish so late in life. Now I have, hopefully, my last husband, <laughs> a three-month-old daughter. Aww. Her name is Ozell, so she's going to have that problem and I get to stand here before you today. I just want you to know that never give up, it's never too late and you can do it. So if I could tell my younger self, I would say, hey, you know, the road is gonna change, but you just keep going. What just happened? <laughs> okay, um, I could talk about this for hours, but let me try and focus on one thing for you guys that, um, I don't know, it may be cold comfort at this point, but I really, although the election of the first African American shook out a lot of racism and the run of the first woman to be on a major ticket shook out a lot of sexism, and if you ever looked at a Donald Trump rally on YouTube, you would get sick to your stomach if you looked at the comments next to it. I think in the end, the loss was not so much about gender. So what happened, you know, it's the oldest story in the world. When I covered Bill Clinton beating George Bush Sr., the, the moment where we all knew that he was going to beat him was the moment in the debate where a woman stepped up to the stage and asked about the national debt. And Bush Sr. was looking at his watch, and Bill Clinton stepped up to the front of the stage and said, tell me how it affects you and your family. And voters want to know what you're going to do for them. And the Clinton campaign made a classic mistake of, you know, a lot of their ads and a lot of the message was Donald Trump is a bad guy. And, you know, I think voters wanted to know, yeah, but all in you know, the flyover states and in rural communities, they felt like they had been passed by and they wanted to know what you know, the candidates were going to do for them. So let me just read you a couple statistics. So 60% of voters viewed Donald Trump unfavorably. 63% of voters thought he lacked the temperament to be president. 60% thought he was unqualified. More than 70 didn't like the way he treated women. 
but he won anyway, and the reason he won is because, as his biographer Tim O'Brien said this week, all of these rural voters wanted a Rottweiler to rip the face off of Washington, so they looked past all of these things about him. I mean, I know I'm not alone in feeling that the, the Access Hollywood tapes revealed something that we probably all suspected about Donald Trump just by the, be, based on the way he had spoken about women on the Howard Stern Show 10 years ago, based on the way he spoke about his wife, based on the way he spoke about his daughter, based on the way that he engaged women who opposed him, not on terms of policy, not on terms of sort of ideology, but on terms of you're ugly and therefore not qualified to engage with me on a political level. So I think most women had an intuition that Donald Trump wasn't a person who was necessarily safe for women, but obviously the Access Hollywood tapes broke that open. I think something though... And yet so many white women voted for him. And yet so many women voted for him, which I'll get to in a moment. And I think obviously so many women are feeling scared, unsafe, ignored by the fact that somebody who is a predator and who is openly a predator is now residing, will soon be residing in the White House. That's a very terrifying fact that we are all going to have to reckon with every single day. And it can't be separated from his policy. It can't be separated from his politics. It can't be separated from any issue because it cuts to the heart of what he feels about human beings. Women are human beings. That being said, something that I found slightly shocking was that Donald Trump spent his whole, his entire run telling us who he was, telling us what he thought about immigrants, telling us what he thought about Muslims, telling us what he thought about gay people. And it took him talking about touching a white woman for us to finally go, well, this guy seems pretty off. And frankly, I think that was evidence of so many voters' privileged view of what it means to be an American citizen. And it's the moment that all of the Republican men stepped up and went, well, not my daughter, not my wife, because it was the first time that they could see him as someone who would hurt somebody that was close to him. And so in a way, even though I am a white woman, even though I'm a survivor of sexual assault, even though that tape chilled me to my core, I was a little bit angry that that was the moment that we as a country decided Donald Trump wasn't a safe person because everyone who didn't have the privilege of being you know, a college-educated white voter knew that on a deep, deep level already. And then in terms of the women who voted for him, I've been hearing a lot of women talk about how angry they are, about the fact that you know, it's their fellow women who got him into the White House. I can excuse the men, but look at these women and the fact that 62% of, of non-college-educated white women voted for Donald Trump. But the thing we have to remember is Donald Trump is reinforcing the message that they have been given their entire lives, which is, your body doesn't matter, you don't have a use to me, you don't have a use to this country. And so, if it's what their fathers have been telling them, if it's what their brothers have been telling them, if it's what their partners have been telling them, why would they believe that they were allowed to hear anything different from the president? I want to... <laughs> we look to people like Dolores. We have these incredible examples of women who have transformed history through their own will. And the thing is, and people who have, I know, a lot about what you've done and the stakes for you were not low and it wasn't like everything make choice that you made was safe and you made a choice to throw your weight against history in a more positive way and demand change even if it meant pain even if it meant fear not to make assumptions about what you felt your entire life so we say to women like you to women you know like Gloria to women like Madeleine Albright to all these different women across platforms, we look at how they've organized, we l and then we use the new tools that have been given us to us, and we keep going. Uh, yeah, that, that is the answer. Don't mourn, organize. This is what Joe Hill said when they executed him. He was a labor organizer. Don't mourn, organize. We have to organize women out there. Each one of us has to give up a little bit of our time, 
a little bit of our resources, and support the organizations that do organize women, like NOW, National Organization for Women, uh, the Feminist Majority, uh, NARAL, all of these women's organizations are out there. Uh, Planned Parenthood, definitely. ACLU also is, is supporting not only women's rights, but immigrants' rights. So we've all got to become participants, as I said before. We can't be witnesses. We've got to, you know, we've got to get uh, into the streets. And it, it might be a little bit out, outside of our comfort zone but we have to do it. It is up to women. And I'm going to quote Coretta Scott King. She said, we will never have peace in the world until women take power. So women, it's up to all of us that we know we have to take power. What I want to share with you today is what I wish I knew when I was 15. The young girl that looked in the mirror and didn't like what she saw was not alone. It was actually how so many of us all over the world are feeling. And we weren't feeling that because of our own self-torture. We were feeling that because we had been taught that we weren't good enough. We were shown such a slim ideal of beauty in the media that we didn't think that we were good enough, that we thought that our value was based solely on our appearance. And it's so wrong. I wish I could tell my younger self that I was good enough. I wish I could tell her that this is simply an outward shell and that actually the light is within all of us. That perfect does not exist. That now on this journey I realize that being perfect is actually being 100% imperfect. All those things we think are flaws that we cannot see when we you know, look at the media, that we cannot see in the people that we idolize, those are the things that make us different. Those are the things that make us unique, that make us beautiful, that we should value more than anything else. And that is what I wish I knew when I was back then. I wish that I didn't look in the mirror and thought that that was it. I wish I could see the light that I was going to shine on all the people around me. That that journey I went on from self-loathing, from negative body image, was a journey that I took because I now can empower other women to not go through that. I now work with the National Eating Disorder Association. I'm so honored because of what I went through and the struggle I went through when I was younger has now actually not defined me, but it strengthened me. And it enables me to connect, to relate to all the people around the world, no matter what we look like, at some point in our lives, we have not felt good enough. And I'm here today reminding myself and reminding all of you that you are good enough, just being you. Thank you so much. Well, you hear so much about organizations trying to get women involved in STEM and about companies that are really saying, women, you need to push that envelope. You need to get out there. You need to learn how to do this. But in reality, when it comes down to it, just one in four jobs in STEM are actually held by women. Why does it matter? How much does it really matter? And how do we really shatter that glass ceiling and that stereotype when it comes down to it? To answer those questions, this fabulous panel joining me, we have fashion designer Rebecca Minkoff right here in the middle. Hi. Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Intel, Danielle Brown. And there to my right is the CEO and founder of Black Girls Code, Kimberly Brown. A lot of fans in the room for these ladies. I call it the gold rush. <laughs> Get into technology now in whatever form you can because that is our future. It's something that's going to be so synonymous to our daily living that it might not be a device anymore that you hold in your hand. Um, I think the way, you know, the, the, the smaller and smaller it's getting, you know, the more, uh, you know, it can be seamlessly applied to your clothing, a tattoo, mm -hmm. um, you know, an amulet on a necklace. So I think there's so much possibility, but I think, again, it's going back to, is it going to help you? Is it going to, is it going to get you through your day? Is it going to give you something that mm -hmm. you needed that worked? And I think that's when great adoption happens. Mm -hmm. It's not just, um, you know, a gimmick. And I think, again, talking with women in fashion, you know, I don't want to wear a dress that lights up. That's yeah. really nice and pretty and tells other people my mood. I might not want them to know my mood. But I think, you know, if you have something that helps you through your day and, and, and makes it easier in some way, you know, then that's something that a woman will want to wear and use. Mm -hmm. Danielle, 
How much does that need to change, though? Yeah. Well, I think what's important to remember is you can be part of the technology industry and not be a technologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly at Intel, we have a lot of hardware engineers. We have a lot of software engineers. I myself am an economist and an accountant by training. Uh, I have an yeah. MBA. You know, we need people that are anthropologists and social scientists. We need marketing professionals and communications professionals. We need lawyers and HR practitioners. All of that is what diversity is about, right? If you're just a company of engineers, that could be a little scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, if, if people like myself are designing hardware, that could be a little scary. It truly is. Um, you know, an industry that benefits from all sorts of backgrounds. And yes, um, STEM and getting that, that foundational engineering education will open a ton of doors for you. Mm -hmm. But it's not the only path that you can take to right. be part of that industry. And I think it's important to, to consider that too. A lot of options. Mm -hmm. Kimberly, yeah. if you could give our audience here one great piece of takeaway advice, what would you tell them? Great piece of takeaway advice. Um, I would say that as women, I think that uh, we often look at one singular path to the final destination. So I absolutely, as a STEM proponent, think that all women should learn to code, be familiar with technology as creators and not just consumers. Um, but I also, in this past week, realized that, you know, it's more, this work is about more than that. Mm -hmm. It's not, I thought five years ago, I started this organization to take, teach girls to code, but I actually realized over the last couple of days, for many reasons, that I was founded or put here to found this organization to teach them to lead at a time when they need to be the leaders of tomorrow. So I say take mm. up this opportunity as an opportunity to put this tool of change in your pocket so that we can lead. Yeah. Um, back in, I don't rem even remember, maybe it was January when he first made these, these public comments about banning Muslims. Um, I remember I was on my way to a, into an Olympic qualifier, and I'm like, if we're banning Muslims, right, and we're sending people back to their, you know, respective countries, I'm like, first of all, I'm African American, where am I going, right? right. <laughs> um, but it's like, I, I mean, I'm out here, like, literally fighting for my country, like, this is a part of who I am, I feel so American down in my bones, so for, to have someone call that into question and to make you feel less than, um, it, it's so hurtful. Yeah. And also, um, I just feel like as, as, um, as a Muslim, as an African American, as a woman, I'm like, well, dang, like, can we catch a break? It's like, this is ridiculous, you know? I feel like now as a country, we have to come together and show, like you said, these people who make these bigoted remarks, who literally are threatening violence, and some who follow through with it, we have to tell them this isn't acceptable, this isn't our country, this isn't what we stand for, and we're not gonna take it. Yeah. I was influenced by my grandmother who was like a very strong kind of, she took nobody's business. She would tell you off, not because she thought she was better than, but just like, this is my space and my seat of power and this is what I'm gonna stand for or not stand for. Mm -hmm. And that always kind of, that was always instilled in me. And whether or not people were, didn't think I could make it in LA who have told me, what do you think you're doing? Like, that's never gonna happen. Like a big girl's never gonna be on TV. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, well, what about just a girl on TV? You know, why does it always, oh, it's about our weight, it's about our weight. And I think that we use what we have, whether it's where we came from, what we, you know, were educated by or with who, or, um, and it was, it was really just about what I wanted to do and not, I never thought like, oh, I can't do it. It was like, but this is what I want to do. And it was hard and it's still difficult. And I think art is finally catching up to life and it's going to take a minute and it's still happening, but I, it's just what I wanted to do, and I never thought that I couldn't do it. It's like when I heard that incident of pussy grabbing, it brought me back, and that's what I continue to say. What's happening in these countries are not any different from what's happening in America. When we blame a victim of rape, when we say it's their fault, in a lot of these cultures, it's the same thing. Women are molded and objectified to please a man. Women are not treated as human beings. We are only good for the pleasure of a man. And I think that's that culture that we are trying to change, is that system of not valuing women, of trying to define a woman's worth through just a man's pleasure. And that's what this campaign is about. And that's the reason why I decided to speak out against FGM and other violences. Notwithstanding most recent development, it's critically important to have women participate in the economy, in politics, 
in leading institutions, and I could only encourage you to do that. Because bringing women to the economic table actually delivers diversity. It reduces significantly the inequality. And many corporate worlds and boards now understand that at their level, it also delivers better value and better shareholder and stakeholder value. And so what I want to say to you is that I was fearless in my professional life, but I was afraid to take a misstep in my personal one for fear that it would hold me back. And so it's important for us all to address all of our fears, whatever they may be, in any part of our life. Thank you very much. What do you all think about how social media images promote perfect-looking people and the kind of pressure that it puts on young girls and the rest of us? Ooh. I think we've all had a really hard time looking at magazine covers, looking at models on Instagram, looking at people around the world that look absolutely perfect all the time. They never have an imperfection. You never see them on the street looking, you know, looking not 100% ready to go out and be photographed. Um, I think it's really hard for everybody to see that and to be able to still feel good about themselves at the end of the day. I know it's been hard for me. Um, but I think it's gotten a, a, a lot. I think we've made some progress um, now with um, uh, putting different body types on magazine covers, showing different body types online. I personally go to the grocery store in pajamas and flip-flops and sandals, and, or flip-flops and socks, and I've gotten <laughs> photographed. And you know, what I think is um, important is for people, and this goes along with what I was saying earlier about showing your real self on Instagram and on social media, is really showing your real self. And being able to feel okay with posting you posting yourself maybe not at your finest moment or, you know, and I think that's really important for celebrities to do nowadays so that people, uh, young people that are looking at this, that are growing up and trying to feel um, confident and uh, not insecure, um, I think that's really important for people to do and I've been uh, pushing for other celebrities to do that as well as I've tried to do and I think that it's really important for us to do that. I think yeah. it definitely makes a difference. You're, you're putting yourself out there. You don't police. Do you police what you post, though? Do you say, oh, I'm not going to post that? Absolutely not. I don't police what I post because I think it's unnecessary. I post what I want to post. I post what's going to make me happy. And I don't worry about if it's going to, you know, make somebody else unhappy or if somebody's not going to like my picture or think I look bad in it. I don't care. I post what I like. I post what's going to make me happy. You spend that time pleasing yourself instead of pleasing other people, and it really makes all that much of the difference. I think tapping into this global community, and as Ariel said, not being afraid, to be, don't be afraid to be yourself, um, whether that's an artist, a sculptor, an interior designer, um, an aspiring blogger, whatever it is, just be yourself and be loud about it and be proud. So, so I think that there's two sides of the argument, you know. We can look at this as kind of um, yes, it, it takes away some of that old-fashioned meat cute, but I think that's just evolution. It's technology. It's the way we share. I mean, you see this with Instagram. People can get hired for covers of Gucci via a photo they posted on Instagram, whereas that would have been, you know, 20 years of hard labor and school and work and job and earning your way up this, this chart. So it's access, right? It's just earning your way into something um, instantaneously. And if I can gain access to a great person who might be in a meeting across the street right now and I'm here, why not give humans that access and that chance and that opportunity to have something that otherwise might be fleeting or might not be um, available? And so the moral of the story is, um, is those three points, really. It's 
Um, know what you're capable of and don't be afraid to demonstrate it. And um, meet people where they are, be accessible and be understood and familiar. And along the way, have fun with it in building connections and camaraderie. Thank you. You know, the Barbie brand is all about empowering girls and inspiring them to dream big and realize a world of possibilities. And of course, we were all very energized by the election. We thought we were going to have our first female president. And while that didn't happen, I think Hillary's words last week, two girls in particular, really re-energized us and inspired us. Because again, we do believe in dreaming big. And, and the Barbie brand creates that platform for imagination where girls can imagine their future selves. But here we go. OK, let's make sure I don't knock her over. Voila. Ah! <laughs> Can you guys see it? Can we, do, can we zoom can in we zoom on this for the people? <laughs> Beyond the fashion, it's, it's so incredible because now I'm not striving to be Barbie like I am Barbie. Everybody can be Barbie. We don't have to be like, I want to be Barbie. You are Barbie. Because a part of what I love about being now a part of the Mattel family is that an iconic Barbie is now keeping up with the times. Yes, yeah, so if you guys can't see it, there you go. Yay! So nice to meet you guys. I, I, I want to start actually with a little bit of, um, of a sobering question, which is about a colleague and friend of yours, former colleague and friend of yours, Gwen Eiffel, who passed away today, as I think many of you heard. Um, Gwen was a groundbreaking journalist, for those who, of you who don't know her, um, her her record, she also was the co-host of the News Hour on PBS alongside Judy Woodruff. So having two women um, anchor that together was a very powerful statement. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, I know you knew, you knew Gwen. Uh, Gwyneth, uh, Gwen was a, uh, a first-class journalist, first-class human being, a trailblazer in many ways, and very young uh, to pass away. And um, uh, my heart goes out to her family, and it made me think of this quote that I shared actually in my Sunday paper on Sunday, which is uh, from Leonard Cohen, which said, you know, spread love, not hate. There are things to do, it's getting late, we're all just passing through. And to see somebody at the height of her career, so young, to leave us, it's a reminder that we're all just passing through, and to make this time, that we all have here to matter. Matter to your family, to yourself, to your friends, and make each and every day, I think we spend a lot of time stressing about stuff that doesn't matter. Mm. I'm constantly Oh, telling, I never do that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> telling my daughters, it doesn't matter. It's not, you're not gonna remember this and to try to focus on and spend your time with what does matter. The face of poverty in the United States is that of a working woman with children and women who are working two, three jobs, minimum wage jobs, and trying to raise families on that. And they, uh, they're struggling, and they don't feel that people hear them, and they're voting, you know, and I, I'm not sure who they voted for, and obviously it's important to remember that two million more people voted for Mrs. Clinton, mm -hmm. so you don't get totally discouraged, but we have a president-elect that people will need to come around to, right, who needs to hear those stories of people who are working paycheck to paycheck because it's millions and millions of our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And I think that is kind of when I'm reading stories about people, they're like, I voted my pain, I voted my rage. And there's always, you know, other, obviously, people who voted for other reasons. But I try to take a moment like this and think, what is the silver lining for all of us? How can we make our country better? How can we come together, men and women? Men and women, boys and girls. You know, I have two sons, I have two daughters. I want this to be a great country for both of them. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to a lot of uh, men, they feel completely misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And they feel that uh, no one talks to them. When I talk to a lot of women, they feel misunderstood like no one hears them. So I think with all of the, you know, media, and media is everywhere and all the talking, so often we don't talk mm -hmm. to really our fellow Americans who are living uh, what I call on the front lines of humanity and working paycheck to paycheck. Right. 
You've heard from some really incredible women at the summit today, and right now I want to leave you with some wise words and a few more. I raise up my voice, not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. I'm tough, I'm ambitious, and I know exactly what I want. If that makes me a bitch, okay.